not only you give to people who follow the right? How much respect you give to the people who come to share with us, but how important you are to them. I have a couple of announcements. Uh, the first is that I received an email today uh, and I wanted to repeat it in person, uh, and that is that North Life will be returning all of the books next week um, to the publishers, which is customary, you know, so they can get not be charged for the books they don't sell. If you have been waiting to buy books for our subjects later in the semester, I would suggest that you get over there and get them. Um, and if you haven't gotten the books that we're using now, I would suggest you go and get them because the midterm is coming up. So um, visit Northlight and get your books. Um, maybe you can have a drink and uh, pick up a crime novel that you can read during all of your free time. Um, we have many guests here today. I'd like to welcome you all. But I'd especially like to welcome some students from uh, Roseland University Prep and their teachers. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Harrison and Mr. Beal, and they are more than welcome, and we hope you'll come again. I hope you enjoy yourself. I certainly have uh, something very interesting for you. Uh, now, um, Barbara Lesh McCaffrey, the president of the Alliance, has some words she'd like to share with you. We'll get used to this. Everybody ready? <laughs> They've given us a new microphone, but the stand is the same, and it makes that same irritating sound. I think it's the hallmark of the lecture series. <laughs> it's my great honor to be here today. Uh, the Alliance for the Study of the Holocaust was founded to support the Holocaust Lecture Series, which is a collaboration between the university and the local community. The university covers the salary of the instructional faculty, and the alliance raises the funds necessary to bring the speakers, and also help coordinate uh, speakers in the schools. And uh, many of the survivors who are with us today have been busy visiting middle schools and high schools throughout the county. In 2006, one of our dearest members of the Board of the Alliance, Walter Kuttner, who was a survivor, died. And the board decided to honor him by having the annual Holocaust survivor panel in his honor. And uh, he'd be still smiling today if he was with us to know that 25 years later we're still going strong. Walter um, lived with his parents in the Rhineland in Germany, and from the time he was 11, he lived in his uncle's home in a Berlin suburb near Bansi. Those of you who are reading War and Genocide, this will ring a bell. And he was a high school student when Hitler came to power. He remained in school until 1934, but due to laws preventing Jews from receiving a formal education, he was unable to graduate and receive his diploma for which he had studied. He ended up joining his uncle in Mallorca in Spain, where his uncle and other members of his family had moved and opened a small stationery store. In 1936, he found himself in the middle of the Spanish Civil War. That's like frying pan and fire. Um, and the family was evacuated to France and then settled in the Italian-speaking sector of Switzerland. In 1937, while in Switzerland, he received a visa and was able to travel to the United States and emigrate to New York City. <coughs> Walter and his second wife, Cheryl, settled in Santa Rosa in the 1990s. And Walter was very active in the work of the Alliance and in the community-wide commemoration of the Holocaust, the Yom HaShoah commemoration. 
He would be so proud to see all of you here today. I also wanted to take uh, another minute or two to honor two survivors who died in the past year to honor their memory and their deep commitment. The first is Sophia Katz, who died in September at the age of 84. Sophia was hidden by neighbors when the Nazis came to her village in Butzlav, Poland, in May of 1942. Her father, three brothers, and her sisters were murdered. Out of the 175 families in her village, only one other Jewish person survived. She ended up in the Vilna ghetto in Lithuania with many other Jewish refugees from Poland. Between two and 3,000 of the approximately 57,000 Jewish occupants of the Vilna ghetto, um, of those 57,000, only two to 3,000 survived. Um, the rest were murdered by the Ansatzgruppen. Sophia joined the resistance, and coming up will be a lecture on women resistance fighters uh, by Mitch Braff, and I'm, I'm hoping that'll give you more background for her life. She escaped into the forest and um, fought against the Germans, fell in love with the commander and hero of the United Partisan Organization, David Kopovich, and became pregnant with his child, her daughter, Aya. The couple were separated after the war. She moved back to her little village in Poland and became a teacher, then on to Israel in 1959, continuing her work as an educator, and moved to the States in 87 to be close to her family. Her family said she loved to cook and bake and would gladly feed anyone who came to visit. Her mantra was, eat, eat. She loved nothing more than to watch and feed her great-grandchildren. She'll be remembered for her undying love for her family and for her undefatigable spirit of survival. The other person I wanted to remember today is Helen Margolin, who was born and raised in Frankfurt und Main, Germany, and in October 38, her family was deported to Poland since her parents were Polish citizens. Shortly after arriving in a small town between Lodz and Warsaw, the family consisting of Hella, her sisters, and her parents were split up. Um, at 16, Hella started a harsh life in the Lodz and Warsaw ghettos, internment in a smaller ghetto, and years of slave labor in a munitions factory in Germany until the end of the war. Amazingly, she and her two sisters survived, but all her immediate family, aunts, uncles, cousins, parents did not. Back in Frankfurt in 45, Hella met and married an American soldier and came with him and their child to San Francisco in 1947. Her husband was a band leader in the Army, necessitating frequent moves during the next 21 years that Hella spent as an Army wife raising four children. Hella credits her survival to destiny, but also to her natural optimism. You have to hope, she says. If you give up, you're lost. Until her death on April 4th, Hella was an active participate, participant in the community-wide Yama show of commemorations. These three people touched many lives, and we are all in their debt for their courage and their commitment. It is my great honor to have given you a few words about them. Thank you.
story to tell you that relates to the notion of what was lost and also what was found. Um, I would like to introduce them as a group and then uh, we'll start with Hilda Katz, our first, and they will tell you all about what they think is important for you to know about them. First, we have Hilde Katz, who lives in Santa Rosa, and Hank Cohen, who is also from Santa Rosa, and Lillian Judd, who is also from Santa Rosa. Their experiences are very different. Um, you wouldn't be able to draw any kind of um, assumption about any survivor's life, because each one of them had a unique experience. Um, they will each speak for about um, 20 to 25 minutes. I'm the ringleader. Um, they'll look at me and at some point I may have to go five, meaning five more minutes. Um, and I'm also Hildy's assistant today. I'll be turning the transparencies for her so that um, you can get to see some of a, a visual picture of some of what she would like you to know. So. Let us begin first with Hildy Katz. Please welcome. Me. Um, Shalom again. And now we are back again. Um, uh, Shalom State College was my alma mater many, many years ago, before you were ever glint in your parents' eyes. Uh, I had a very good experience here. Of course, it, the campus consisted of three very stark buildings. There was no greenery. However, there was plenty of parking, and they parked in the street. <laughs> My tuition, the tuition I paid, would probably cover you for your thing today, maybe for two weeks. Anyway, I'll give you a little bit of my background. Um, <coughs> I lived a very happy and a free life as a six-year-old in a picturesque Bavarian town called Aschaffenburg. This is why I wrote it out. That's my hometown. By the Jewish community, my grandfather was the patriarch of the Jewish community, and life was very sweet. Um, however, um, some of what I'm presenting you today is brutal, a brutal reality and may be hard to swallow. Please bear with me. After the Nazis came to power, life was not so sweet. Latent anti-Semitism has existed in Germany for decades, for centuries. The Nazis made overt anti-Semitism the cornerstone of their politics. The slogan was, Jews are our misfortune, they are our calamity. It was not a rhetoric, but it became a battle cry. Justifying this, justifying Jews, casting them out of society. A few examples, Jews were prohibiting, prohibited from holding public office, from public employment, mandatory relinquishing and ownership of businesses, and students were unable to attend public schools. And the list goes on. Eventually, Jews were stripped of their citizenship. They were stateless, there was no protection under the law. After Kristallnacht, do you all know what Kristallnacht was? It was what it would be called probably the pogrom. It was the evening when all, most of the synagogues were burned, Jewish stores were smashed and looted, Jewish men were taken to jail. After this, it was a sort of a, a wake-up call to the Jewish community. My parents sent my sister and me on kinder transport to safety in England. Now, the kinder transport was developed after Kristallnacht, when the British Parliament made 10,000 visas available very quickly. Um, and um, we were transported out by trains. And I think that began right after Kristallnacht until just beginning of the war, which was almost two years later. I came to a foster family to help, and I was not allowed to attend school, but these people did save my life. So my education stopped at the age of 14. Three months after I arrived, war was declared. There was sparse communication with my parents, who could only write 25 words, 
via Red Cross letter, they to me and I to them. They were concerned that I could not continue my education, and I was concerned about their well-being. They tried to assure me they were all right, but in veiled, veiled terms they wrote about restrictions on their lives. Something like, we don't go out much in the evenings, we keep to ourselves, thank God we still have our nerves. I discussed later that Jesus had to relinquish radios, phones, bikes, dogs, had to, uh, warm clothing and warm bedding to be sent to the German soldiers at the front. They were allowed half Russian cards. They could only shop between 4 and 5 p.m. By, what, by that time, the shops were pretty empty. They were not allowed on public transportation. They had to observe very strict curfews. Of course, they had to wear the yellow star. And I learned from a friend that my mother somehow hit, she clutched her purse over the star and when she was blonde and blue-eyed and went undisturbed. Um, eventually, Jewish families, my parents had to take in another Jewish family, and eventually they were herded into so-called Jew houses, houses where several families waited, uh, lived there awaiting transportation. They were there, uh, by the way, under guard, uh, 24 hours, seven days a week. In the last Red Cross letter that I received, my parents intimated they would change residence. Soon thereafter, and it was three years into the war, they were notified to report to the train station at 5 o'clock on April morning. They were informed they would be resettled to the east. It actually was a ploy to lull um, Jews into believing that they would be resettled in the countryside in Poland. My parents were among 135 Jewish residents of our town who boarded a train to a nearby larger town, Würzburg. The way for Jews there, the group had to wait for Jews from the surrounding communities until the um, transport could be assembled to so a total of 852 people. During their wait, they had to sleep on the bare ground in a beer garden, I believe. And uh, on one or two of the evenings, the Gestapo functionaries held a party and raffled off the belongings of some of the Jews that they brought. You will see them on the overhead pretty soon. On the fourth day, the group marched through town in broad daylight to the main railroad, sta railroad station to port a transport that would take them to an unknown destination. So for, though forced to board the train, they had to pay for their transport. But they were also told to bring lots of food. Of course, I knew none of this until much, much later. After receiving my parents' last letter until the end of the war, I wondered where my parents might be. Why I had not heard from them? When war ended, I went to the Jewish agencies every week to um, uh, see if I could find their names. We're looking at the survivors lists weekly. Their names did not appear anywhere. Finally, I realized they had not survived. At that time, we learned about Auschwitz. And soon every Jew returned and perished there. When we learn about six million Jews murdered, it is vast, almost impersonal number that we can hardly digest. But when it comes to two persons, a father and a mother, the wounds go deep. It has always plagued me that I could not find any definitive information about my parents' faith. I was hardy that I could not even pay homage to them. No grave, no marker. And there were moments when I grieved that they were not allowed to see, to live, to see me a careful, a carefree, sometimes confident child turn into a responsible adult. As the years wore on, Information dribbled out 
about some of the transport and possible destinations and beyond. But I wanted to know specifically how and where my parents suffered. I was willing to face what might be painful discoveries. How did I begin my search? My efforts secured food and often difficult process extending over several years. In past years, I returned to my hometown several times. In fact, some of us former Jewish residents were invited. I discovered, um, and there I discovered, that the transport did not terminate in Auschwitz, but a place in Poland called Itzpika. I put that on, and you will hear me uh, talk about this somewhere. At last, I had a uh, starting point. I contacted the International Tracing Service, it's a part of the Red Cross in Germany, and had, I was told that they had a large repository of names of victims of the Holocaust. I was <coughs> informed it would be a laborious process to find my parents' names and ask for my patients. I was patient. I waited. Over the next many years, I read that more information became available. I contacted the Red Cross four more times. Despite additional searches, they were unable to find my parents' names. Yad Vashem, the, the Holocaust Museum in, in Jerusalem, researched my files, but notified it that none showed my parents' names. Oh, I thought, surely the German Railroad had this. I was wrong. I turned to the Ministry of Justice in Bavaria, hoping that during the Nuremberg war times trials, lists of transports of Jews and destinations would be available. Not so, but I'm tenacious. I contacted the German Federal Archives, hoping they would help me. They couldn't, and again my hopes were shattered. A friend here in the U.S. had a friend in Germany who presented himself at the tracing service to search for her parents and was given some information. So I wrote him, asked him if he could do the same for me, but I had no answer. Dr. Berenbaum, I think who will be a speaker here in the very near future, uh, presented a program here some years ago while he was, I think, uh, the director of the Holocaust Museum in, in Washington. Anyway, I literally called him, asking if he could obtain the information I was seeking. He gave me his card, asked me to email him, and to email the details. I did. I had no fun. He was probably after the time with others. others. Then I turned to Dr. Michael Faber, a well-known pediatrician at the Holocaust Scholar. He devoted a great deal of time in searching various transports. He made me dreams of suggested final destinations. And this was my first hope that I might begin on the right track to find where my parents might have perished. However, I was seeking something definitive. I next contacted a rabbi, that was my tenth contact, by the way, who had been doing similar research. He sent me a copy of the, of the deportation list he obtained from Wurzburg. He discovered my parents were number 79 and 80. My next, uh, the next, and then about six years ago, a miracle I had heard from friends in Aschaffenburg that a teacher took students to a Holocaust exhibit in Berlin. They saw Gestapo photos, the only ones ever taken of transport in Würzburg. They were kept in the archives for over 60 years. I contacted the archivist in Würzburg, giving him information I had that my parents were on the transport each speaker. The archivist sent me photos. I, I could not recognize my parents. They also sent copies of 
papers taken from my parents when they were strip searched. And this took the long instead of design. I have some photos of the transports. Won't you show them right now? and you will see them all with their white bags slung around their shoulders and I, I think they care as, want you to care as much as was humanly possible. You can see their Jewish stars. The white bags probably also contain some of the food that they took with them. communities in Bavaria have attracted a huge attention, especially the English. Another stroke of luck, I had contact with a wonderful researcher in the Institute of Contemporary History of Munich.
the 12th contact. I'm contact with a wonderful woman at this institute in Wuhan, which is a think tank. We should publish a book and commentary with those photos. They sent me a copy. I sifted through the pages, hoping to find my parents. And I couldn't recognize them. Not for all these photos were taken 60 some years earlier. However, I looked through the book and found a footnote. Name of another researcher from the Institute. Thank God for the email. <laughs> I, he steered me to a researcher in Poland. I'm still here. <laughs> um, about this uh, in Poland, he, that he knew about as much about the detention and what occurred afterwards in Eastern Poland. And thus began a wonderful long um, cyberspace relationship with Robert Kubalik, whose name I put up. He's a social scientist who's made it his mission to research the transport, what occurred in Zika, how long transportees languished there, and their final fate. By the way, he's not a Jew. At the same time, Another researcher in Munich did similar research, and it was she who discovered the mystery why my parents' names and that of most other German Jews were nowhere to be found in the body. As I mentioned earlier, um, the Greek German Jews lost our citizenship. Once these people boarded the transport, they were persona non grata. I don't know what the deal was. Persona non grata? In other words, to the Nazi authorities, these people were non existent. Once they transport, um, once they enter the transport, the lists were not set with them, they remained in this group. I worked for Mr. Kowalek in Poland that my parents' transport traveled about, I think, between six or seven hundred to eight hundred miles to speak of over a three-day uh, period. I'd always wondered, why he speak up? And then I discovered that it was on a convenient railway line to three death camps. Uh, uh, Belsek, Sobibor, and Mayer, Meinerek, you might have heard of them. They were well heavy in eastern Poland near the Ukrainian border. So the unique, unique researcher, and Mr. Kobani, that there were three possibilities leading to my very final fate. And please bear with me. In a way, I'm sorry to burden you with this information. Number one, they were they remained in the speaker for about five weeks, then were killed immediately in a rival, either in Belsek or Sobi. Number two, before the transport arrived in uh, its speaker, it made a short stop in a small Polish town, Krasnoskin and Krasna, and I learned the names of a lot of Polish towns, and I learned to pronounce them. Uh, there were about a hundred people who were marched two to three miles, were shot and buried in mass graves. But, <coughs> or while in, if they were riding in speaker, they may have been shot. But however, all three prospects are devastating to me. I also understand that I have to deal with reality. <coughs> however, my two researchers were pretty sure that my parents were among those who remained in the speaker for five weeks. Therefore, I wanted to find out what my parents' quality of life was during the weeks that might have been there. And Mr. Kowale, the Polish gentleman, mentioned in his email that a young Jewish boy lived in his speaker during that time. He and his family eventually sent to Sobibor. He survived, he eventually came to the United US and has written two books about his experiences. And once again, thanks to cyberspace, I Googled this young boy, his name was Toby Black. I Googled Mr. Black and was astounded to find his email address and phone number in one of the book's title pages. I left messages and soon he contacted me. Mr. Black told me that the speaker was a small village of 3,000 Jews and 200 
Catholic. And you know it's the only community in Poland that had no yet home and still does not have a Catholic church. Many townspeople they speak of were poor, lived in wooden flats, there were just three artesian wells for water to them. The smaller village became a transit camp when it suddenly was overwhelmed with thousands of Jews from the uh, Western Europe. However, there was some stability to life. Although it was a shock to those who arrived in transport from sophisticated Europe, European cities, and when we now was to find no paved streets, filthy condition, 20 people crammed into one room in primitive, primitive shacks, no latrines, and um, there's an outbreak of type <coughs> and color. Uh, it must also have been very difficult for the people in the speaker to welcome to find find as many Jews. I also learned that a permanent Gestapo combat existed in there. It was ruled by two psychopaths, particularly when they enjoyed shooting Jews in the early morning. The Germans, by the way, recruited the Ukrainians who were willing helpers, proven anti Semitic as the Germans were. There were regular morning roundups, all prisoners had to go clear selections in the name. As many as could be accommodated were loaded into cattle cars to be sent farther away. No one in that year of 1942 knew what farther away was. Some believed it was a further evacuation. By happenstance, this young total black then 15 learned from a Gentile friend whose father worked on the railroad that the cattle cars ended up about 13 miles away in a large enclosed area surrounded by trees. As he described it, the gate swung open, the train entered, the gate was shut. Sometime later, the empty train exited. In hushed tones, the boy told blood that the people were immediately gashed, their bodies flung into mass graves. Belzec was one of those killing camps. It began with gangs, and they were found unsatisfactory and were shut down for several weeks, months. It was uh, that is when the transport arrived to the speaker and people languished there until Belzec reopened with more efficient gas and chambers. Sixty years, 63 years later, uh, through joint effort by an American Jewish organization and the government of Poland, Belzec was rededicated and a small memorial was there. Even at that time, the shards of bones and hay could be found in the earth. The irony, or perhaps the blessing, is that the Jewish victims then farther away believed we were being relocated and had no idea of the imminent effect. At arriving in Belzec, they were told they would be doing agricultural work. Does not have spread these seeds of germs, they were told to be slow. Women were ordered to lie up and their hairs were shaved. Of course, we don't know what occurred subsequently. Yes, this has been devastating to me, but my parents had to suffer the crew of the humanity. And I wonder whether going to their death, they might at least have, not, have had an iota of comfort, knowing that they saved the lives of their daughters by sending them out of Germany on the Kindertransport. But for, for me, there's also small comfort that the existence is not completely expunged. My hometown, Aschaffenburg, is embarking on a five-year project rededicating the existence of its former Jewish community. They're beginning with tripping stones. I think Hans will tell you more about them. They're metal cracks and tasty sidewalks. They will be located in front of houses where Jewish residents live. The plaques will be engraved with their names and ultimate faith. And here at Sonoma State, I will arrange for a memorial brick with my parents' names to be installed in the genocide memorial grave. As our ancestors long requested for my parents' dad, Sarah, and skin, this has been well worth it. 
I can now pass all this family history to my children, to my granddaughter, and to the public at large as it is here. And thank you for bearing with me. years ago, Nick, my brother, who was then eight, and I, Tim, stood on a platform at one of the railroad stations in Berlin and waved goodbye to our parents. <coughs> a long journey started at that time, which ultimately ended here. To go back a little bit, that scene. a small town on the Baltic Sea coast in Germany, Stralsund, which was one of the old seaports built initially around 1350. It was a walled city. city still pretty much looks now as it was when I lived there because it was restored under UNESCO auspices as one of the cultural heritage sites. Now it has about 100,000 100, inhabitants but the old town itself which is what I grew up in which is seen here had about 35,000 people living in it when I grew up and much of the growth in population has come since, since the war. In uh, the early 90s, my family had been living in the community for four generations and had been quite well established. In that small city, there was a small Jewish congregation, about 130 people, 40 or so families, most of them had been there for many years and were pretty well established in business and otherwise. My family operated a uh, rather large men's and boys' clothing store. They manufactured it and also sold ready-made and served the surrounding communities. My grandfather had uh, initially started it. Then my grandmother took it over and eventually my father and his brother <clears throat> took over. It was a pretty comfortable life. We were fairly well to do. And uh, things were going quite well. 1933 then changed. 
the Nazis took over, and uh, the new laws came in. By 1935, my father lost his business, and uh, we were forced to move to some extent, but remained in the community. I know that my parents had wanted to leave, emigrate. But uh, my father had been wounded fighting in World War I as a German soldier and walked with a limp. And that was an automatic disqualification for almost any country because they felt that he would be a burden. They kind of made their peace with that, that my father, after he lost his business, became busy helping other people to emigrate to leave the country. Gradually, the situation became worse. Between 1935 and 36, uh, 38 rather, my brother and I were in public school, attended appropriately, did what we were supposed to do, but they gradually forced us to sit in the back row, teachers wouldn't call on us, and we were ignored as much as possible. And it was, it was about that time when I was eight, I think, when I was first jumped by a group of guys on the way home from school, who kind of emulated their older role models who were always out beating up on Jews, and they decided to beat up on me. <coughs> This was fairly tolerable because, you know, they hurt me, but they couldn't really get to me if I could run then. <laughs> and uh, we all survived. In November 1938, the night of the broken glass, three o'clock that morning was a pounding on our door. Several men in uniform were out there and grabbed my father and hauled him off to a concentration camp together with all the other Jewish men of the community. Later on that day, we found that they had torched the synagogue, which was built back in, 19, in 1736. And um, later on, again, there came a pounding on the door on noon, I think it was, and another group of guys were there, and they took my brother, me, and my mother, and marched us out onto the street, where we found that they had assembled several other Jewish women and kids, whom we knew, of course, and marched us down the main drag to the main square. And uh, I spent my first night in jail that night. Just about 10. Shortly after that, on the same day is when they also said, you're no longer allowed in school. And uh, it was at that particular point that my parents made the decision to send my brother and me to a children's home in France. And that's why we were at the railroad station in Berlin in March of 1939. Now, just to give you a sense, the big one there is me, my brother's younger one. We were a couple of clueless kids, obviously. <laughs> and uh, that was taken just before we boarded the train. This is the main square in Chicago. The old building is the city hall that was built back in 1300 something or other. Next to it, smaller building, is the police station and jail. That's where I spent my first jail. And these buildings are still intact. This is a picture I took just about three years ago. Still there, still functioning. 
This is what the main street looked like. The house that we lived in was the one right in the middle. And uh, those days they had streetcar tracks going down the street. Those are gone now. It was a pretty benign town. Once we got to France, we had no idea what was going to happen to us, obviously, because basically we were these <coughs> clueless kids. And uh, we arrived at the children's home there. They had a chain of those set up by a organization that was serving to house refugee children from Germany. Eventually, they housed roughly 3,000 youngsters like myself. And out of those 3,000, probably 300 came to this country and survived. Most of the others eventually wound up in concentration camps or were otherwise killed or run away. Why and how come I brought it? I were picked to go. We still don't quite know just what happened about these things. A lot of random things happened in those days. While in France, this was in 1939, we arrived there shortly before the Second World War started in March of 1939. The war started in September 1st, 1939. By summer, they had enrolled us in French public schools, and we had, in the meantime, spent some time trying to learn as much French as possible so that we could get to the school system and do what we had to do. And uh, we were pretty good about it and learned the language rather quickly, but spoke it with the German accent, which, of course, marked us. But since France had a region which had originally been German, the Alsace, Alsace Lorraine. We were passed off as kids who were refugees from Alsace Lorraine rather than Germany. And uh, we got away with that. By September 1939, the war started. Germany had invaded Poland, and uh, Britain, France, declared war on Germany. That immediately started nightly air raids and a tremendous amount of commotion. We were issued gas masks in those days. And we all walked around going to school. These canisters were, were almost as big as we were. And, uh, but life went off. Our nights were usually spent in air raid shelters in the basement of the children's home. And uh, it was rather noisy. There weren't any bombs being dropped in the early days. But the Germans did fly over, and it was basically a scare tactic on their part. By May of 1914, the Germans actually crossed into France and invaded. And they very quickly moved along. As a result, we were evacuated to the central part of France into another children's home. And these children's homes were usually old castles which had been abandoned. And uh, it was pretty rudimentary living conditions were rather difficult. There was no civil heating, no civil water, no civil toilets, no civil nothing. And uh, the food service was lousy. 